Good evening, everybody. Glad everybody could make it out tonight. Hope everybody's enjoying the hot weather. Maybe you're not sweating too bad. Uh, I've got a few announcements I'm going to read over here. Uh, mark your calendar. The American Red Cross will be here Monday, June 19th from 12.30 to 5.30. Plan to donate blood on that day. This Sunday, this Sunday morning, June 18th, there will be a short informational meeting in the high school room for all high school students interested in the canoeing trip on the Buffalo River. That trip's going to be on Saturday, July 8th. This meeting will be immediately following AM worship service before Bible class. And it's also for any chaperones uh, that would also like to come. And if you do want to chaperone that trip, you can contact Russ Kirby or Tyler Temple. Uh, this summer, instead of having the regular VBS, we're going to take a trip to the Ark Encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky. And that'll be on Saturday, July 5th. Uh, the church will be paying for the admission costs for all children but adults are responsible for their own tickets. A bus will be provided for anyone who needs a ride, and for more information, you can see Luke Phillips or Aaron Lyles. June 20th, we are hosting the Summer Youth Series. Uh, that'll be on that, that's a Tuesday. It'll be at 7 p.m., and we are asking members to bring cooked macaroni and cheese, chips, and cookies and have them at the building by 5 o'clock. Uh, if you're willing to help with that, please see Mark, or you could call the office. Uh, as far as prayer list goes, um, our sympathy is expressed to the family of Tony Williams in his passing on Monday. Tony is the husband of Terry Williams, who used to attend here, and the father to Josh Williams, uh, who grew up at the Benton Church. The visitation was this evening at Collier's, and uh, the services were uh, started at 7. Uh, Mary Lou Levan fell and broke some ribs in her pelvis, but she has been moved to superior care in Paducah and is feeling well enough to have short visits. She is in room 312. Roger Jarrett is back in superior care in Paducah, and he's in room 401. Uh, Brad Hall will be having surgery in a few days. The family asks for your prayers. And Bill Hicks is back at home and he's feeling better. He's still using his walker, but he's confined to his house. And he wants everyone to know how much he appreciates all the cards and he'll be back soon. Uh, if you would, please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this day and all its many blessings. Uh, thank you for all those who are here tonight, and thank you for the opportunity we have to come and worship you. We ask that you be with all those that I've just mentioned uh, that are having some health issues, and we ask that you be with all those who are looking after them, and please give them some comfort and some strength and bring them back to us soon. We also ask that you uh, be with this congregation as we search for a new youth minister, we ask that you uh, send the right person for us and somebody who can uh, help us and lift us up and somebody who we can also help. And please be with the youth during this period of time. We ask that you be with us uh, for the remainder of this service and into our classes. And through Jesus we pray. Amen. I forgot one thing. Uh, the ladies class... We'll meet tonight, and Linda Janice will be teaching. As the announcements were being made, I was sitting and thinking about the events of today. I think it'd be fitting that we all remember each day, try to remember this week. It'd be good if we always remembered it. But um, our government and the culture that we live in now, it's unbelievable. I mean, what happened today and... Maybe we need to all try to remember to pray for our government this week. And uh, certainly our prayers go up to God and it can make a difference. Let's sing Now the Day is Over. We'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then Mark will bring us our devotional. Mm -hmm. 
Turn in your Bibles over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 8 and 9. Uh, Let's look at verses 5 through 7. Let's look at verse 5 through 7 of 1 Peter chapter 5. In that passage says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt exalt you in due time, casting your care upon him because he cares for you. As you and I read that passage, we see that Peter is closing out his book. And as he closes out this book, he's talking about the importance of attitude. Now, remember who Peter is. As we read about him in the gospel, we see an impetuous guy who can fix any problem that's in front of him, Sometimes he doesn't quite fix it in the right way, though, right? Uh, Jesus says something about sacrificing his life. He sends up to Jesus, grabs him, and says, you're never going to die. That's never going to happen to you. You stop talking that way. And Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. You see, a time when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, he uh, pulls out his sword, and he cuts cuts off Malchus's ear. And Jesus reminds him, those who live by the sword have to die by the sword. You see the time where he sees Jesus walking on the water. What's he say? Hey, let me walk on that water too. And so he hops out there. And of course, because of his lack of faith, he begins to fall. And he has to be saved by Jesus. And you see this impetuous man now, around three decades later, being a person who's able to write about humility. And being a person who can write about how God takes care of us. And about how we have to cast our cares upon him. And so one of the things we see here is the importance of growth. Every one of us have a responsibility to grow in God. And so look at your life that you're living and look at the way that you are and ask yourself, how have I grown this past year? What is it that God has taught me? What is it in my Christian life that's better or more mature than was just a little while ago? Flip that coin over. And realize that every one of us in here are growing as well. And so when you see somebody, don't judge them over what they've done 10 years ago or 5 years ago. Don't judge them over what they did when they were a young person. Because they, like Peter, have grown. And they have matured to become more of what God would want them to be. But as you and I read this passage, we see these words like submissive. And these words like humility. And we see the importance that humility needs to play in our life. 
We all know the passage that says that pride comes before the fall. And as you and I think about that, I think we remember what humility means, at least to the Christian, is in many ways we have to admit to ourselves we can't fix the world. Sometimes as a young person, we think we can fix any problem that there is. And sometimes even as an older person, we think, man, I can handle myself, whatever God puts in front of me, whatever Satan throws in front of me as well, I can take care of it. And we have to realize that we cannot take care of our problems by ourselves. The only way we survive is by trusting in Jesus. The only way we survive is by showing our faith and clinging to him. And as you and I in prayer and as you and I in growth go through life, we learn more and more of what we can do for him. But I want to close this evening there on verse 7. Cast your care upon him because he cares for you. It's a word in the Greek, and I know a lot of people don't like Greek too much. I never liked it, that's for sure. But the word for anxiety is merimano, M-E-R-I-M-N-A-O. And what that word means is to be pulled apart from every direction. It's something like what we would do if we were ripping a garment or if you're ripping something up for whatever purpose it may be. And it's interesting that the Greeks chose that word for anxiety because that's a physical description of what happens to us when we are stressed out, right? You feel like you're just being ripped apart on the insides because that's all you can think about. And maybe you feel sick to the stomach, maybe you feel some pressure in your chest, maybe you feel some pain in the joints and things such as that. Well, we read in the Bible that we need to be very careful, that we don't become anxious about the things that we're facing. Spiritually speaking, sometimes when we face the things of this world and the troubles of life, we end up getting ripped apart, don't we, in different directions. How many, how many of us feel like we're spinning all these plates? You know, you have a plate at home, and you have a plate at work, and you have a plate at church, and you have a plate, you know, in all these different places, and it's so hard to keep everything functioning and everything going, and we think to ourselves, unless I do each one of these aspects perfectly, then everything's going to fall apart, and so our, our view of God becomes distracted because we don't have time, because there's not enough of us to give to God in worship because there's so much that's going on. Well, when we feel anxious... That is our opportunity to show faith. When life begins to fall apart, that's when it shows who we really are. It's really easy to be a Christian when we're sitting in a building. This church building here is. And it's really easy to be a Christian when our job is going well, when our family is going well. It's really easy to be a Christian when we have really good health and we just feel like we don't have any problems. That's when you need to build your faith, because when your faith shows is when times are tough. And when your faith has to show, you and I have an obligation to begin to show others our relationship we have with God. Proverbs 55 and verse 22, cast your cares upon the Lord. And in that case, he will be your salvation. Cast your cares upon the Lord and he shall be your salvation. A passage I think every one of us have memorized. Philippians 4, beginning of verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so when you and I read that verses 5 through verse 7, we see two main lessons. Lesson number one is don't be so prideful that you think you can handle every problem in life. God created you and God created me to need God, to need Jesus. If I could handle everything that happens to me, then there'd be no reason for the Son of God to die on a cross. I need Jesus, and you need Jesus as well. The second lesson is be careful when you have anxiety. And remember, this is an opportunity to show faith. Not that you can spin all the plates in just the perfect way but that you can use this opportunity to put your trust in God, to do your best to be a Christian in every episode and in every circumstance and putting him first in everything that you do. Tonight, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to obey the gospel and become a Christian or if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
Bibles to the book of Haggai. Am I not? Am I? All right, good. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Haggai. Or Haggai. I like hey guy as opposed to hey girl. So, anyway. I think what happened was the uh, email thing that I sent to uh, put it up on a board. I had too many pictures, so I think it was too big. I think that's what happened, Lori. I'm guessing, because every time I send it to you, I don't get anything back, but I don't think you've gotten it, have you? All right. So we'll do it old school, which will work out just as well, because that makes me where I don't have to stay on subject if I don't have slides to worry about. Haggai is one of the more famous of the Old Testament prophet books, but it's the second shortest. Obadiah is the shortest, and then you have Haggai. Haggai lived at a time which uh, about 100 years, or excuse me, about 70 years after the fall of Jerusalem. Jerusalem fell at 586 B.C. The uh, first wave of captives that came out of Jerusalem, which would have been Daniel and friends, would have been 606. 586 is when the temple was destroyed, and so about 516 is about the time which Haggai is working. And so what happened was when the people came back from captivity, and they came back around 538 to 536, when they came back, they began building the temple, but then there was a lot of opposition, and so they got scared, and so they stopped. And so the building, the temple, was about half built, but... It was just left there. Everybody went and worked on their houses. Everybody went on with life. They sort of more or less went through still working on the uh, temple and, or uh, as far as worship goes. But the temple remained unfinished. And so Haggai comes on the scene and he is well known because he, uh, his preaching, which is here about rebuilding the temple. You'll recognize Haggai because if your preacher knows Old Testament, this is the book they go to every time you talk about giving. And so you probably, if you've heard a sermon on Haggai, it's been about giving. And, about, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit more. And so as we go through the book, notice what, let's get to verse 2, okay? When you get to verse 2, notice what the people are saying. Thus says Lord of hosts, this people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And so there's a problem which is going on, and every time it comes up, they say, well, you know, it's just not quite time yet to do it. And yes, we know the temple needs to be built, but, you know, let's just give it a little bit longer. Let's let it work a little bit longer to go. So verse 3, the Lord, word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses, and his temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Look at verse 6. You have sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves when no one is warm. And he who earned wages, earned wages to put into a bag of holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. All right. So what we see here is the reciprocal nature, especially of Old Testament. When Israel did God's will, then God would bless them. When Israel failed to do God's will then God would not bless them. And oftentimes, God would curse them. And you see that going on throughout the entire Old Testament. And that's what's going on here. Now, let's bring that to a modern-day application. What are some things that maybe we ought to do that sometimes we see people putting off in the service of the Lord? What would be some examples? We think to ourselves, yeah, I need to do that, but we just never get around to it. Okay. Somebody you know who is not in the saved condition, who needs to meet Jesus, and we just keep thinking, you know, I need to talk to him. I need to get around to doing that. And we just wait and wait and wait until sadly, perhaps, sometimes it's too late. It's a great one. What might be another one? Okay, visiting folks. Okay, stopping by to see someone. Because we're always busy. A lot of times it's hard for us to find a time to go see somebody. But when you go see them, it ends up helping you more than it helped that person which you went to go see. Okay? What would be something else? Lax in our attendance. Okay, become lax in our attendance. It's not time yet, you know. Yeah. You know, we'll get back in church eventually. Procrastination. Procrastination. Absolutely. 
And a lot of people look up and find themselves apart from the Lord because they weren't diligent in getting after these things which they needed to do. And so what you see here in the, this Old Testament passage is God says, listen, I'm not going to bless you until you obey. And so you plant, and even though you may have a garden, even though you may have fields, it's not going to produce the way that you need it to produce. You can drink, you can do these things to take care of yourself, but you're never going to find health. And notice what he says here. You make money and you put it into a bag, but it's a bag of what? It's a bag of holes, right? Okay. Remember VP Black he used to always have his sermon, the bag of holes, and that's what this revolved around, was it that verse right there. And so notice what God tells him here in verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You go up to that mountain and bring back the wood and build the temple, and I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth will withhold its fruit. I have called for a drought on the land and mountains, and on the grain and new wine and the oil, and whatever the ground brings forth on men and livestock, and on the labor of your hands. All right. And so notice that's what the problem is. Now skip back, if you will, with me to verse 4. Okay? Instead of focusing on God, they had done what? They had built... Yeah, their own houses, paneled houses. Now, wood paneling may be a little out of style. We don't see as much wood paneling today as we used to. Remember, we used to have a lot of wainscoting in houses with the wood panel. Back then, that was considered to be luxurious. If you had your house and you put that wood paneling on the inside of the house, it was a very luxurious thing to do. And so what Haggai is saying is, you know, look at the house that you live in and compare it to the temple... And ask yourself, where is it that I'm spending my money? Where is it that I'm spending my time? Where is it that my heart really is? And that's an interesting exercise for every one of us to look at ourselves and ask. Okay, where does my giving rank as far as my monthly expenses? When you look at the time and the energy that I do, does my church work compare to what I do for fun? Does my church work compare to my occupation? What is it that I'm giving God? Do I just give him the leftovers or am I giving him the first fruit? Am I giving him what he truly and actually deserves? And that's a pretty interesting question right there is, why is it you think in our lives we sometimes get our priorities mixed up? I don't think we're evil. I don't think we're bad. And I don't think these Israelites necessarily were just evil and bad people. But why is it our priorities get all askew? Because we're busy and we're around every day so many worldly people, so many non Christians. Okay, you're around worldly people every day. We have the perspective we have. Okay. We don't realize it, but it's what's going on. All right, the people around us, they kind of get to us. What was that over here? We're walking by sight. We're walking by sight, not by faith, and what? Okay, yeah. It, it's human nature. We get in that groove. We see the people who are around us, and we kind of compare ourselves to them a lot of times. We walk by sight instead of walking by faith, is what Ed said. And there's times where we just need to take a step back, look at what we're doing, and say, you know, where is it I'm living? What is it that I'm doing? You know, am I giving God his due? Not to say we can ever earn our salvation, but we need to be able to give to God that which he, he has already. Uh, as you read in another Old Testament prophet, God already owns all the cattle on the hills. God already owns all the gold that's ever been found upon this earth and all the gold that ever will be found upon this earth. It's not like God is poor and he's just hoping, man, next Sunday I hope they make budget so I can make it through the week. That's not what God's doing. He, he, he can live without our contribution. So why is it that he wants us to give to him? If he doesn't need our money, why is it we should give? It's a way of showing love. Absolutely. Okay, as we sacrifice, we show our priority. We show how important he is to us. 
He wants us to be Christ-like. And the way to become great in the kingdom is to serve, isn't it? And so it's really important for us to make sure that we're not like these Israelites, working on paneling our houses, working on fixing everything that we have, and then leaving the Lord's house in neglect. Now, physically, I don't think it works all that well for us because we have a beautiful building, right? And so this illustration doesn't work exactly in that way. But when you and I look at our life and we see what we give to God, what would our house look like? And what have we given to the church? And I'm not just talking about monetarily, although that is a part of it. Where is our priority? Where is our heart? Where are our thoughts when we get into these sort of things? And so it's something pretty important for us to see here. Now, let's run to verse 12, okay? Now, Zerubbabel, this is the king, okay? Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people and said, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, <coughs> the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord their, of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Now, a little bit later, there's another vision. That's what brings us to chapter 2. And so when we get to this vision, we're going to see the next problem which comes up. And we're going to get there here in just a second. The first vision is on fixing daily life. Making sure that God fits in our daily life exactly where he belongs. And so you and I have to decide, okay, we know where God is on Monday. And obviously the folks here know where God is on Wednesday night. But where does God fit in your life Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? What are we giving to the temple of God? To put him where he belongs. Now in chapter 2, as we get here, notice chapter 2, verse 2. and We'll read this. Now speak to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is, not, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all of you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. Okay? Now we're coming down to verse 9, but let's go ahead and read to it. Verse 6, for this says the Lord of hosts. Once more, it's just a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter temp temple shall be greater than the former. That's an important verse there. The glory of this latter temple is going to be greater than the former, says the Lord of the hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. All right says Lord of hosts. Now, when I left a congregation, I, well, I left a church, I guess they're in Jackson, to move up here. That was a scripture I covered. And the reason I covered that scripture was that was a church which was famous because back in, I think the 70s, they had reached a certain number. And we had worked really hard to finally get up to that number as well. And the number was about 380 each Sunday. And we'd worked hard to get there. But one of the things about that congregation was whenever you would accomplish something good, they would always tell you, well, this is good, but man, I remember back in the 80s and back in the 70s, you know, and a lot of those people were younger back then, and they always remembered the good old days to the point of the detriment of the present. They'd always say, well, I remember how wonderful things were at this time, and I wonder, I remember how great this was or that was or whatever else. You ever meet a fellow that way? Who always remembers the good old days? You know, man, I remember in the good old days, we'd just sit on the front porch and we would shell beans, right? And you'd say, well, the reason you're on the front porch is because you didn't have air conditioners, you know? They'd always forget the good parts because, or the bad parts because they remember the good parts which were there. That's what we're reading here in Haggai. 
They're rebuilding this temple. But as they rebuild the temple, even though it's according to God's plan, is it ever going to measure up to what Solomon had? No, there's not that much gold. There's not that much wealth. There's not that much prestige of the cedars coming down from Lebanon, the gold coming up from Ethiopia, everything being put together in just the right way. And so Haggai realizes as they're getting to work that they're going to be super discouraged because what they have is not going to compare to what Solomon built. And so those who were alive 70 years before, who as small children were able to go through Solomon's temple, now they're looking at it and saying, ah, it's nothing close to what it used to be. And, you know, our religion and our nation just doesn't measure up. And Haggai says, now wait a second. The gold on the walls may not be as prestigious. And there may not be the cedar timbers. And there may not be the golden shields which were given away by the kings when we were a nation. And he says, but I promise you, the spirit of this place is going to be better than the spirit that was in Solomon's day. Now, what we're doing here is we're playing a little bit with uh, words, right? Greek word for wind Anybody remember what it is? I bring it up all the time. Same as spirit. Numa, yay. Yes. Tyler's going to graduate from free as soon as he writes a paper. Hopefully it'll get written, right? Maybe. All right, Numa. You heard a pneumatic tool, right? It's an air-powered tool. You've heard of pneumonia. That's a disease of air, really, is what we're talking about when that happens. The word wind is the same as a word for spirit in the old... Um, in the, in the Greek, which is there. Same with the Hebrew, more or less. And so, when God wanted to give Adam the spirit, what did he do to his nostrils? He pneumed. He breathed into those nostrils, which are there, and that breath gave him life, right? When they were giving birth to a nation, and Israel needed to cross the Red Sea, Moses raised his staff, and what blew across the Red Sea and separated so that they could be birthed as a nation? The wind. And across they went, right? What brought the food every day? And also the quail as well, the wind. And so you see that life-giving wind. And God is making a point. Solomon establishes a temple. And when he establishes the temple, suddenly the cloud appears over the temple and fills it. Just like it had done with the tabernacle as it led the children of Israel through the wilderness. And so the cloud comes in to where they can't see anything. And that is the symbol of God's presence. Now Ezekiel has a vision where the cloud is in the temple and the cloud is removed because God has pulled his presence away from the temple. And that also is at the time in which the temple was destroyed, right? So now here you have a temple and God says, listen, my pneuma, my presence, the glory is going to be greater in this temple than what was in the past temple. Well, this temple is the one that was around in the days of Jesus. Herod was working on it, rebuilding it, remodeling it. But for the most part, it's the same temple. And so how was the presence of God greater in this new temple? The old one had David's son, Solomon, in it. The new one would have the very son of God worshiping in the temple. And even cooler than that, can preachers say cooler? Even neater than that, in Acts 2, the apostles are outside of the temple, and in what comes by to signify the Spirit? The rushing wind, the pneuma. And it appears above them like a fire, and they go into the temple, and they begin preaching, and God's kingdom is now established in Zion. And now all the nations are able to flow forth to it, or it flows to all the nations. And so... What Haggai is saying is, you may look at this and say, man, it doesn't measure up. It's not as great. But Haggai says, let me tell you, what's going to go on in this temple is greater than what's ever gone on before. Now, let's apply that to our modern day, to what we're working with right now. You and I may look at ourselves and we say, you know, boy, I'll never be a giant like so-and-so or so-and-so spiritually. And I see these leaders who are here and these preachers of times past who are so eloquent and so good at everything that they do. And sometimes we look at ourselves and say, man, I don't measure up. 
as long as you're faithful to God, God will work great things in you. You may be somebody who's not eloquent. You may be somebody who can't get in front of a crowd. You may be somebody who can't really even teach a class, right? Remember many years ago, I got in this kick where I was going to volunteer to teach different Bible classes. And I volunteered for the cradle row one time. And I sang and I danced. I did everything I could do. And every one of them just went, <sighs> went to sleep. Almost like Sunday morning preaching. No, just kidding about that part. But I worked and worked and worked. And, you know, I can't relate to those folks at all. You know, the little ones, I can't teach like other people can. Well, all of us have different talents. And sometimes you may say, listen, I just teach this class or that class. I don't measure up. If you do the work of God, great things will happen. And God is going to accomplish great things in you. Now, we run in trouble when we compare to other people. Because God has different plans for different folks. Remember in John 21, where uh, Peter's sitting there and he said, Well, you know, what about John? How's he going to die? And what's Jesus tell him? In my translation, if I, was, if I was doing it, I would say, None of your business, right? What's it mean to you what he does? You go and feed my sheep. You go and follow the Lord, is what Jesus told Peter. You go and do your job. I'll take care of John. Well, it's the same with us. But great things will happen within us when we are faithful to God and when we put him first. Now, one last big vision that we're going to see. Go down to chapter 2, verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, where the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, <coughs> Thus says the Lord of hosts, now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in a fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches the bread, stew, wine, or oil, or any food, will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, No. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it become unclean? So the priest answered and said, Well, sure, yes, it will be unclean. And Haggai answered and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and whatever they offer there is unclean. Now carefully consider from this day forward, from before the stone is laid upon the stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days when one came to a heap, a heap of twenty ephahs, and there were but ten, when one came to the wine vat to draw fifty baths from the, the press, but there were only twenty. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, and the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yet yielded fruit. But from this day on, I will bless you. Now we got one more after this. But let's talk about this one. The law of clean and unclean. Okay? If you have something nasty, uh, something that is gross in the refrigerator or whatever else it may be, you pull it out to throw it away. If it touches something in the fridge which is clean, does that make it the nasty thing clean? No. It's still nasty, right? Okay. If you have something clean and it touches something nasty, what's just happened to the clean thing? It's now nasty, right? Unless you're like me and the boys, we, belong, we believe strongly in the five-second rule. Something falls on the ground, and you pick it up within five seconds, it's okay, right? I'm not sure if all the germs and bacteria and the viruses of the world agree with us, but that's how we live. That's how we work. What's the point being made here with the friends and close acquaintances that we have? The point is, it's a lot harder to encourage somebody and make them clean, and it's a lot easier to be discouraged by somebody and to be made dirty. We have an obligation to be in the world, to be among the people, right? And just as Jesus dined with the sinners, and just as he was in the world to try to show the gospel to other people, so also if we're to be Jesus' people, if we're to be Christians, we've got to be out in the world so people can come. We're not to live in a monastery where there's a wall between us and the world. We need to be out in the world, being the salt of the world, being the light of the world. But when you're out there, recognize it's a lot easier to be made dirty than it is to be made clean. So if that's the case, 
how can you and I, as we go through life, how can you and I make sure that when we're in the world, we're not being influenced by the world? Okay, stay in the Word. Know what the Word of God says. Okay? All right? What are some other ways that you can stay clean? Associate with clean people. Associate with clean people. All right? A lot of folks here at work are in a very worldly environment, right? A lot of the folks are in school. Schools are tough. Man, they're rough. You know, sometimes when I used to go pick up the kids after school, I'd leave the windows down and Wow, listening to some of those 16-year-old kids talk, you think, whew, if your mama could get a hold of you, you'd be in trouble, right? It's a rough situation to be in. So how do you stay clean? You stay in the Word. You try to find people who are good influences on you. You always remember your mission, your purpose. Yes, sir. Dan? Dan? Right. So what you're saying, say two different sections, what you're saying is in order to be a Christian in the world especially, but anywhere, we need to be focusing, focusing on other people rather than just ourselves. When we remember that we have a responsibility to pray for people, to encourage people and to teach people, and we're thinking about others instead of ourselves, that makes us stronger. And then also just reading your Bible and recognizing the importance of a daily communion with God. Those two things. And, and also, I like the verse where it says that there are those that uh, know the scripture, but they deny the power thereof. Denying the godliness, yeah. They don't, they don't understand how powerful the scriptures are. They just read it like a book. That's right. That's right. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's to motivate them. That's true. To motivate them. You've got to be motivated. Very good point. Very good point to have there. All right, let's look at our last vision. Verse 20 of chapter 2. And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, <coughs> excuse me, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heaven and the earth. I will overthrow the, kingdom, the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms, and I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. 
In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shetel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring because I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. All right, what you see here is a very humbled man being lifted up by God. This man was the governor of Judah. Now, notice he was still of the royal family, but he was no longer a king. Now he was just a governor, a governor of a nation, governor of a state, which really didn't have a lot of power, could barely afford to put together a temple, and had citizens which were very afraid. And what God says is, I am going to be with you and shake everything else apart. You're going to be my signet ring or the seal of my authority, and I'm going to hold you up. Now, what are some things we learned from this passage? Well, many people who write commentaries are going to focus quite a bit about how this is a foretelling, a foretelling about Jesus, because Jesus would come through this man as we read of in the genealogies. And so... What Haggai is saying is, from the seed of this man is going to come the one who shakes the kingdoms and establishes a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, right? Matthew 16 and verse 18. Another point we'll read in commentaries is the necessity or the importance of showing respect to those who lead the church. Showing respect to those who are over God's people. Now, guess what? Leaders in the Lord's church our people. Are they perfect? No. No. All right. Thanks, everybody, for not nodding too enthusiastically on that one. I appreciate it. All right. James chapter 3, verse 1, right? Those who preach the word of God had better be careful because they're going to face an even stronger judgment that's there. But we also see in 2 Timothy, when Paul is describing elders, he says elders need to have an extra measure of grace. When one person brings an accusation, don't listen, but require that there be at least two witnesses against them because their job and their work is very difficult. One of the reasons why some churches have problems is because the Sunday dinner that every Christian eats is stewed elder and roasted preacher. And when your kids and when your family hears every Sunday and every Wednesday what everybody did wrong in church, and the dumb things which the elders are doing or the dumb things which the preachers are doing, don't be surprised when those kids grow up and they don't love the Lord because all they've heard is what's wrong with the church. A lot, lot, lot of preacher's kids grow up and they don't become Christians. And I think one of the reasons for that is when they're at home, they hear all the stresses and the troubles that are going on in the church. Because preachers sometimes feel like they can't talk to anybody about bad stuff until they get in their home, and then they discuss it in their home. And maybe that's true with elders as well. Do what you can to show grace. Do what you can to show respect to the leaders in the church. This young man who was leading the nation at that time had not stood up and told the people to go ahead and build this temple. He needed the prophet to come. But God still said, I am working through this man, and this man is worthy of respect. And I think that's something important for us always to remember. Okay, key verses to look at. Go back to chapter 1. That's where our favorite verses are right here. Okay. Chapter 1, verse 2. All right. I need to do it, but it's not quite time yet. When you find yourself saying those things, when those lips pass or those words pass your lips, we've got issues, right? Go a little bit further. Look there in verse four. Is the time is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses and a temple to lie in ruins? There's a comparison there. And God may make a comparison on that final day. See, I don't have slides, it makes me go too long. God may make that comparison on the final day. How does your house Look, compared to what you've given to God, what would the judgment be for each one of us in that case? All right, thank you for being here, and I'll see you Sunday morning, Lord willing.